Okay, today, Mir Hashem, we should finish the book of Shmuel Aleph. This one, Perak Lamed Aleph, Pasuk Dalid. So, Shmu, uh, Shol is fighting his final battle. His three sons have been killed in battle. Now, the archers have located him, and the Jews are, are, are losing pitifully in this battle, and Shol knows that his end is extremely near. So in Pasuk Dalet, Vayomer Shol Lenose Kalev, and Shol speaks to his arms bearer and says, Shlok Harbacha, draw your sword, Udakreni Ba, and spear me with it. Kill me. Why? Penny of Oha, Reli Maela, lest these uncircumcised come, Udkaruni, and they will pierce me with their swords, but more importantly, these halalubi, and they will mock me, they will denigrate me, make fun of me. That's what he asked. Lo'ava no say Caleb, and the arms bearer refused to do it. Why? Kiorema oh, because he was very much afraid. But what was he afraid of? He was afraid that, uh, his dove says, afraid of Hashem? Who's, how, can I, how can I send my hand against the Mashiach Hashem? Against the one that Hashem anointed? Can't do such a thing. So if he won't do it, Vayikach Shol Asachera Vayipolala. Shol took his own sword and he fell upon it and he killed himself. According to one medrash I found, he he he, he lodged in a way that he would fall at it on his throat, and that way it will be able to kill quicker, I guess. So Shol, um, now you'll see in a minute. Uh, well, let's do the next pasuk to get it clear. By Yar no se of Kimes, and the arms bearer saw that he died. Kimes Shol that died, he died. By Yipul Gamhu al Charbo, and he also fell on a sword. By Yomosimo, and he died with him. Pasuk Vav. By Yomoshol Ushloshes Banov, the no se Kalev, and Shol died. His three sons died, and his arms bearer, Gam Kol Anoshav, and all also all the other men who were there in the battle. Vayoma, who on that day, Yachtov, they all died together. So, the obvious question that all the Mephorshim ask over here is how, what gave Shol the right to, to kill himself, to, to commit suicide? We know Judaism does not allow this. So, and this is, uh, so there's a Chazal we we'll talk about this. Uh, let's get the right one. The Medrash Rabba says in Brashis Rabba, uh, Brashis test, it says uh, when Hashem spoke to Noach, he says, "Va'ach es damchem l'nafshosechem edrosh," and also your blood from of your souls I will seek out. So Mora says, "Lahavi es achaynikatzel." Those words include even suicide. That you know, I will I will seek out the blood. Even, even the blood you take of your own blood, I will seek out from you, which you're not allowed to do. You cannot commit suicide, according to the Torah. Then, then the measure says, Yochel Keshol. So I might think, what about, uh, this would apply to Shol. Talmud Lomer, Ach. Talmud Lomer says, Ach, but there'll be exceptions to the rule. So you see that there are exceptions. The measure is saying that Shol did not sin over here by killing himself. Uh, and the reason that we'll read a few of the sources, but basically uh, the reason is because, and, and he says it himself clearly in Pasuk Dalet, Utkaruni, you kill me, because they will kill me, the and they will mock me, they will denigrate me, uh, make fun of me. And that was a critical point. So let's now go through some of the commentaries and they'll elaborate on this point of why this he was allowed to do this. Um, the, the Radak discusses the origins of the word hisalalu, and uh, Targum says that the Kiris Harbe, much stabbing. You know, Lahavdo, like when you see the, the Arabs get a hold of a, of a Jewish boy, uh, you know, it's not like they kill him. <laughs> It's like they, everyone gets uh, 20, 30 jabs with their sword to really get the job done. But it, it's beyond killing. Killing is one thing. If you go, if you go to the battle and just kill him, then, then, then he wouldn't have killed himself. But it's, it's all this denigration. 
that's happening. That's the problem. And that's what the Malkum says. Uh, that is, it, he says two things. They will kill me and mock me. It means to say, one of the two, maybe it would be okay. If they'd only mock me but wouldn't kill me, well, okay. Then a life of suffering you have to be willing to live and not kill yourself. So he wouldn't have killed himself if they would have just mocked him. Right? And if they would have killed me, uh, 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 but, but not mocked me, it also would have been acceptable. Okay. Uh, but, uh, so, that, since those aren't the options, it's going to be both. They're going to kill me and denigrate me at the same time. So then, there's no point already. I'm going to get dead anyway. And it's going to make a bazillion, so that's already something that's allowed. So since they're certainly, they're going to kill me, and before they're going to kill me, they're going to mock me. So, better I should die without any suffering, without any shame. You can't shame the body when it's dead, the same way you came alive. Although we'll see they do something, but, but not comparable to what they could have done. Uh, now, all the Mephorshim say, even though it says Bameis, he fell and he died, he didn't die yet. And we won't know that really until you learn Shmuel Beis, where more details of his death are released, as it were. And what it means, he gave himself a mortal blow. And he was not yet dead. When he fell on the sword, he did not yet die. As we'll see later, uh, he has to ask somebody else to finish off the job. Uh, but uh, certainly a mortal blow was enough that uh, for all intents and purposes, he was no longer alive. Uh, he, Malvin says this, Radak says this as well. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, and then it's a debate exactly uh, what exactly who killed him if the person told him but that's not for now that's for another time um, now let's take a look at the Musr Hanavim in a second uh, uh, well I might as well bring it out the Radak speaks out he says in, in the next Sefer as an Amaleki is going to come to David and tell him the whole story of how Shoal dies and an Amaleki says he told me to kill him, to finish him off. Since he was dying anyway, he told me to finish him off. So, so if that's true, then that's very um, proper mita, connected mita. Then at the end of the day, he, he spared the Amalekis, and he had to come on to Amalekis to kill him at the end. That's one way of understanding it. The Radak says, but it could be the Amaleki lied to David. And he didn't kill him at all, but found him dead after he fell on the sword. In other words, he fell on the sword, maybe it took a, an hour till he died, right? But he found him dead, and, he, and the Malachi wanted to find favor in David's eyes because he thought that David didn't like Shaul. And he said, oh, and I killed him. I finished him off. Maybe that didn't happen at all. So this disputing, clearly an Amalekhi said that he killed him, but if indeed he did kill him, was Shaul's um, self-inflicted wounds enough for him to die by himself or needed somebody else? That already is a debate amongst the commentaries. Um... Yeah, so the Radak basically says the same thing as the Malbim, brings everything the same. Okay, so that is the general answer. The general answer is that if you find yourself in a situation that you will, A, you will die for sure, and B, you will be mocked and ridiculed, and then, then you're allowed to kill yourself. And, um, and, and the reason, I think, is obvious, because we know that the Jewish person is, is the representative, representative of Hashem in this world. We are Bani Mat Hashem Lokim. We are the children of Hashem. We Mamish have the Tzalman Musa Lokim of the real Hashem. So when somebody, um, uh, what's the word, uh, we, we inflicting this kind of pain, uh, well, when you catch somebody and you want to get the information out of him, what do you call it? Torturing. torturing. That's what they tortured him. So you're torturing the image of God. So. You're dealing with the image of Hashem now. Now, on the one hand, you're not allowed to kill yourself, you're not allowed to die any sooner than Hashem wants you to die. But if what will come out will be a chil Hashem, a desecration of Hashem, why? Because a Jew represents Hashem as well. A Jew is the ambassador of Hashem. So that's a desecration of Hashem. And he cannot allow a desecration of Hashem to take place. So, therefore, he was totally justified in what he did. Uh, at the end of the day, again, I think it's, it's, a, it's a lot of mida keneged mida. 
that at the end of the day, Shaul, you know, didn't know where to have mercy, and eventually he was cruel in places where he should be merciful. So Hashem, you know, puts him in a situation where at the end of the day he has to kill himself and be cruel to himself at the end for the final for the final justice to happen to him. Now there's a <clears throat> There's a number of interesting madrashim that the Musa Navim brings down over here. One of them I already mentioned before, but the Musa Navim brings a very nice new insight. We mentioned this one. Hashem, when Moshe was up on the mountain, Hashem showed him all the generations from now till the end of time. He said, Dor, Dor, Umalachov, every generation is kings. Dor, Dor, Vechachamov, every generation is in its wise men. Dor, Dor, Manhigim, every generation is leaders. Dor, Dor, Meshanov, every generation, and the second in command every generation and the officers, every generation and the supporters, but also every generation and the people who were robbers, every generation, people who, who took things um, and paid for them, but the people didn't want to sell them, also things that are illegal, every generation and their prophets. And then he showed him, Shaul and his sons falling and dying in battle. And, and, and uh, Moshe said to Hashem, the first king of the Jewish people, him and his children are going to die by the sword, so what's the answer? Do you remember this Medrash? What was Hashem's answer? So Hashem says, you're talking to me? Emor la Kohanim. Speak to the Kohanim. And this is the Medrash on, in Parshas Emor. Emor la Kohanim. Speak to the Kohanim. Because he killed them and they're prosecuting against him. And that's what it means. So we mentioned once before, that's a very strange Medrash. What kind of answer is that? So uh, we said, that uh, and and really it fits in. I'll say I'll say the other the pshat he says then will fit in the other one as well. He said there's a second question on this medrash. I understand you're showing all the great leaders, all this. Why did you have to show us who the robbers of any generation were, the rotten people? In other words, Hashem showed you everybody. Hashem showed us the Rambam. For sure, he showed us the Rambam. He showed most of the Rambam. He also showed you all the uh, the Jews who uh, became apostate and became the greatest enemies against the Jews. He showed this all to Moshe Rabbeinu. He showed all the great people, all the terrible people in many generation. So the great people we can understand, but why doesn't he show the terrible people? So the answer is, because if you really want, because why was Hashem showing Moshe the great people? To be able to appreciate that there's going to be great leaders for the Jewish people down the line. But the only degree you can really appreciate how great a person is, is to know who he had to go up against in his generation. Who are the wicked people in generation? Right? To be a great person in a generation where everybody's accommodating and good, it's not such a trick. But to be a great person in a generation where there's terrible people and still he's a tzaddik and he's able to overcome that, that gives the greatest measure of who that tzaddik is. If the tzaddik can overcome that. And uh, that, that, that's what he showed Moshe. To the extent of how great the tzaddikim were only by based on how uh, terrible was the extent of the wicked people. So I think that this will fit in a little bit into this. So when he, so when he shows you Shaul uh, and, and realizing you know what kind of leader he was, I mean you got to realize that there were there were some negative Rishoyim that Shaul hung around with and realized his advisors and people like that, things he had to overcome. He had to overcome the Amalekim, and this would determine what kind of a leader he was. And he wasn't able to overcome each and every one of these obstacles. And that's why you appreciate a little bit, you know, what a leader has to go through, why he isn't as great a leader as he could be, why he was an amazing leader, depending on, on the other external Rishoyim that existed in terms of what he had to overcome. That's part of what makes a tzaddik a tzaddik and defines how great of a tzaddik is, how he deals with these Rishoyim. So certainly Shaul, you know, to a certain extent, uh, his failure was in his inability to overcome certain Rishayim in his life. But uh, finally, dealing with, uh, speak to the Kohanim. So the truth of the matter is, why did he have to die? So, so you could say, well, what, do you, what do you want from the guy? He was a very, uh, why, why, why did he do it? So he doesn't give the answer. Hashem doesn't say, well, because he, he killed Adol. Uh, he didn't kill Adol of Amalek. He says, go to the Kohanim. He means the Kohanim, go to the Kohanim, that are those Kohanim who died by uh, the city of Noth. It's those Kohanim. Go ask them. They'll tell you the answer. So what does that mean? The answer is Shaul Melch would have wanted to have a, a defense and say, what, what do you want from him? He didn't kill all of Amalek. You see, Shaul was a very kind-hearted man. A very humble man. Didn't, didn't assume him to be a, a big man. And uh, 
He couldn't, he couldn't take it upon himself to kill all the Molik. He's too much of a pacifist to kill all the So that's, a, that's a, uh, a defense. And therefore he shouldn't get killed so horribly. And that's Moshe maybe trying to defend Shaw. You pick the king because the king has to be humble. But on the other hand, Shem says, you're right. You know what? That's why I tested him with the city of Nov. That's why I had them, the guys speak Loshan Hara. Doyek speak Loshan Hara against them to give Shaw a test to know, let's see what kind of guy he is. If he would say, you know, even though he was upset with him, he said, yeah, okay, but I'm not going to kill you. Then, then I see, you know, it's right. His nature forced him into that. So he couldn't do it. But once I saw how ruthless he was with the city of Nov, then I see he's capable of being ruthless. And he could be ruthless on a bunch of wonderful tzaddikim. Why wasn't he ruthless with Amalek? And that was what he's saying, go speak to the Kohanim, and they'll give you the answer to that question. So, you know, when you see Hashem has to deal and give terrible punishments, there's always a reason for that. Okay. Um, yeah. He also said that uh, Moses was told that in every generation there would be prophets. He was told who the prophets of every, until the end of the generations of prophets. As long as there were prophets, he told them who the prophets were. So then it stopped. When it stopped, it stopped. When it stopped, it stopped. There were no more generations of prophets. So the, the, he only told as far as we go. And he'd say there would be no more prophets then. Hmm. Now, there's another Medrash that says uh, on, on this Pasuk, he says, it says, Al hei chatoi nerego se tzadik. Shol, the, oh, the Gemara calls him also tzadik. This tzadik, referring to Shol, he's always called tzadik. But for five sins he was killed. And in Divrei Yomim it says, uh, uh, quote Divrei Yomim, it says, Vayom Shol, Shol died, b'mol asher mol v'ashem, that, that he was mol, mol means, um, he took liberties, like, like, like mol behektish, taking something you're not supposed to take, it's called mol, like to go against. He went against Hashem, not exactly clear what that is, that's one. Number two, Val Shaharik Nov Verakohanim, and number two, he killed the city of Nov. Number three, Al Shacham Al Agag, he had mercy on Agag. Number four, Val Shalosh Shamal Shmuel, he didn't listen to Shmuel, if you recall, long ago. Shmuel said, wait for me seven days before you fight the Plishim, and he didn't wait. Uh, and, and that he inquired from the Ov and the Yudoni and didn't seek out Hashem then and Hashem killed him and then he brings the Medrash brings the Pasuk and the Ov that Hashem treats everybody the way he's supposed to get it based on his actions so the Muslim Nevi'im analyzes this uh, this Chazal so uh, so he says so these are these are the five things number one is he was mal now it's interesting what does it mean he was mal you know he, he didn't listen to Shem like so what specific action was that well the other four are exactly yeah but it says five yeah <laughs> the manager says five things so so let's see so 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 uh, so it's on the words so Really, it's going beyond what the Pusik says. The Pusik is much more cryptic. The Pusik doesn't say any of the things. The Pusik says, he didn't bring the whole, the whole Medrash. It says, B'malo asher mal b'ashem. So, malo is one thing. Malo b'ashem is the second thing. And then the Pusik goes on. Al dvar Hashem alo He didn't, he didn't listen to what Hashem said. That's, that's what the Pusik says. Three. He asked from the Ov, and then hey, it says again, the Lord Doris Bashem didn't seek out from Hashem. So then they divide up these five things, and the first one, Mal, means he killed Nov. Number two, the second Mal is he had mercy on Agag. The third one, he didn't wait for Shmuel, as it in Shomar. The fourth one, he asked from the Ov, and the fifth one, he didn't, he didn't, uh, he didn't seek out from Hashem. So the med, the comment, the med, Muslim Rebbe asked a question. So this, these are the five. Hold on, hold on. That's going to be one of the questions. So the first question is, what's the first thing that's mentioned? That he killed no. Now these are the, you're listing his five sins. So usually would list the worst sin first, right? So why is no mentioned first? So again, he's saying the fact that he did not destroy Amalek was not such a big sin. And that's following on what I just said before, right? If he wouldn't have sinned with no then the sin of Amalek we could have defended a little bit. 
But since he killed out the city of Nov, that really was a worse sin than killing out Amalek. You know, and so, so, so that was, uh, uh, and, and the fact that he could have mercy on Amalek, even, you know, then it makes it even worse, because really, what, what's so bad about having mercy on Amalek, besides the fact you're not listening to Hashem, we got to re- realize that Amalek are the people, of the nation, who, who is categorically against Hashem more than anybody else. And you know, it means you have to feel the pain of the Jewish people if Amalek exists, and Hashem's pain. And if you realize the Pasuk says that Hashem's throne is not complete until Amalek is completely destroyed, so how can you have any Rachmanus on them? So it really is a big sin, but maybe his nature wouldn't allow it to him. But after he destroyed Nov, that's why it's mentioned as number one. Um, uh, another answer is that uh, we mentioned Nov first, because Hashem deals with a person very important rule. Hashem judges a person, Mida Keneged Mida. Uh, and because that's really what the rest of the Pasuk brings in the Medrash. It brings the Pasuk in Ov and says, Ki Paul Adam Yishalim Lo, because based on the actions of a person, Hashem uh, pays back to him. So, uh, so therefore, uh, which, uh, when Shol, he says, Dalmash Shol, Shol Bov Yidoni, Avalo Chika Begilgal of Yosel Shmuel, the fact that he asked from the Oven Yidoni, and the fact that he didn't wait by Gilgal to attack the police till Shmuel came, he says, that doesn't deserve to get a death penalty. In other words, a number of the sins he did did not deserve to get a death penalty. You don't get a death penalty for just not uh, listening to the Navi. You don't get a death penalty for asking the you know, Oven Yidoni per se. But, uh, so why did Hashem include that in the death penalty? because he judged Nov with the death penalty. That's the thing. You know, Nov did something wrong. Okay, did something wrong. So maybe a little Rachman or something. But he gave them the strictest measure of the law. Nobody could have said, okay, it was wrong. Okay, you didn't hear about it. Okay, mitigating circumstances. We'll show a little Rachmanus to you. But he didn't show one shred of Rachmanus in a situation where certainly Rachmanus could be had. Because their, their defense wasn't, was a pretty good defense. We didn't know you were upset with him. We knew that he was, he's your son-in-law. All the things they said, what do you want? That, that should be at least some mitigating. Okay, you want to punish them? Okay, fine them. Put them in jail for a couple of days. Fine, give them lashes. Okay, kill them. That is absolutely zero Rachmanus. So Hashem says, fine. If that's the way you deal, that's the way you judge people, then that's the way you should be judged. That's why it mentioned no first, because it says, why did he, he got killed because of five things. Number one reason to get killed is because he was such a strict judge on everybody else. So it's a very important Muslim before Rosh Hashanah. Uh, you know, we're all going to be judged in the next uh, 10 days. And, uh, you know, so, so we, we, no, one, no one in this world is, is without sin. And Hashem is going to have to exact some kind of punishment to us. So we want to know how is he going to judge us? He's going to judge us exactly the way we've been judging other people. And when people do things that are wrong and we are merciless to them, and we, we're going to get the full measure of our satisfaction in punishing them, then it says, if that's the way you feel judgment should be held, then I guess that's exactly the way I should judge you. So therefore it's a good idea to, uh, even though the other person was co- completely wrong, we're not talking about here judging favorably here, not a question of judging favorably, the person did something wrong to you, the person mamish did something wrong to you. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, there, and there's reason, and we're, not, and we're not saying the person did something wrong and he's going to continue to do it and has no remorse, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a person who did something wrong and uh, is not going to do it again, and that's remorse. The question is, are you, are you going to cut him any slack? So you don't want to cut him any slack? That's going to be the first. That's going to be the first thing Hashem is going to put up on the list of what He's going to check. The first thing Hashem is going to look when He judges you is how did you judge other people. That's going to be the top of the list. Not a bad thing to talk about on Rosh Hashanah, maybe. But uh, that's the first thing He looks at. Well, the other is not so important. But how did you judge everybody else? That is the, the way of how He's going to look at other people. Um, now, final question that you just pointed out is: What do you mean He didn't seek out Hashem? Right, so, uh, so he, but so he himself said, when Shmuel said, "Why did you go to the others?" He said, "Well, Hashem turned away from me and didn't answer me." Hashem went to the Navim. He went to a bunch of proper channels to seek Hashem. What do you mean he didn't seek Hashem? The answer is that's not what he's talking about. The sin was 
all the time that Shmuel was alive, even though Shmuel separated from him, there was nothing to keep Shaul back from running after Shmuel and saying, Shmuel, what should I do? In, in all these circumstances, with no the other situations, Shmuel was still alive. So well, we had to see him know. He said, you know, I should kill you all. Wait a minute, Shmuel is alive. Shmuel is a Navi. Shmuel will know what the real truth is. You know what, I'm going to put you guys in jail. I'm going to go to Shmuel. I'm going to ask his opinion. So even though Shmuel turned away from him, but he still was alive. So now, it's, 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 it's not for your covet to go to Shmuel. That, that, you, know, you know he's the only man you can go to to ask from Hashem. So the time when Shmuel turned away until Shmuel died, that's what he means. He could have gone to him and didn't go to him. And that means that he didn't uh, seek out from Hashem. Okay. Uh, the Muslim Vim has a lot more to talk about on Pasuk Vav. We ask why the Shmuel Shol gets such a horrific punishment. But a lot of things he said we've already spoken out over the course of the last few months. Let me just see if there's one more thing over here. Um, one second. Oh. Uh, he says, he says an interesting thing. He says, um, even though he sinned by no, interesting, he says, re really, maybe there's a way he could have got out of being punished by Nov as well. You're going to see how this is a reciprocal problem. You'll, you'll see it. Because, you know, there is one, he has one mitigating factor that could get him off the hook with killing of, of Nov. And what would that factor be? Doe. What? He has Doe. He has Doe, that's true. But, uh, but it's interesting uh, when when he when he uh, when he when he brought the uh, spoke to Shmuel through the Oven Yidoni, right? So Shmuel doesn't mention to him the sin of killing Nov. He says Lo Asisa Charanapo Baamolik, you didn't kill out a Molik, and Shmuel himself doesn't mention. So Juan Chazal says because since Shaul was too embarrassed to mention that he was ashamed for it, so Shmuel is not mentioning it. But he adds. Because the truth is, when a king is constantly at, at, engaged in wars and with killing, I mean, a king who's a warrior has to kill a lot of people, right? So that will bring him to, in other words, life will be looked at very lightly in his eyes. If you kill a lot, it's hard for you to take, to view life as precious. Mm -hmm. you know, you're a soldier killing, whoop, 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 you're killing millions, tens of thousands of people. Once you've been in battle and, and you've been lowered to that level of your mom is killing people like that, the value of life is minimized in your eyes. We can't deny the fact that the value of life is minimized. So it could be once he's already in that mode and he sees that no, he perceives them as a threat, so we can defend him a little bit and say, you know, he thinks they're an enemy, so he, uh, he'll kill the guy. So, so then, then it's possible. And maybe the same thing with David Amelech, that he got Uriah killed because David killed a lot of people. And we'll see the story with Uriah that you know maybe he wasn't so careful, but uh, but 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 then it goes back. But if that's the case, so if you're such a killer, so why didn't you kill out all of them, all like? That's right. So it goes both ways. You see, on the one hand, you can say he killed Amalek. Maybe maybe he wasn't as strong enough to do it. Yeah, but look, you're able to kill so many. You're a warrior, man. You're killing so many people. I mean, if you have so much mercy, then why'd you kill out No. Okay, fine. But maybe we shouldn't punish him for Nov because it's hard to kill. Yeah, but you. He, but you killed a lot of people. So it should be easier to kill. So if it's easier to kill, so why don't you kill them all? Like, so it's reciprocal. It goes both ways. One is teaching on the other. Each one alone might not be enough. But finally you have to have both, and that's what does them in. Um, uh, another answer why Shmuel only mentioned the killing of Amalek and not the others is that all the other Aver, well not all, but three of the other Averis were after Hashem took away the divine presence from him and he already was in this state of depression. That state of depression, even though he's responsible for what he does, but still in all, it, it doesn't rate to be mentioned as highly as the other things there. Um, oh, so there's one last uh, thing he brings out which is very interesting. Um, the the question is, how does uh, you know what, what did Shmuel say to Shaul? He said, if you will do tshuva, 
then you will sit with me in the next world. So uh, the uh, let's have to find it over here. And that's what Shmuel also told him. He said, if you're going to run away, you have an option of running away. You could save yourself. But if you accept upon yourself the attribute of justice and you don't run away, then you and your children will sit with me. That's the Medrash adds. So, now Shmuel was on a great, great level of Kedusha. Mom, she was a holy person his whole life. He was a Navi of the Jewish people. Now let's figure, where do you think Shmuel's sitting in Oilam Haba? The lowest level or one of the highest levels? He's probably on a pretty high level, right? Still in all, what did Shmuel say? He didn't say, if you accept this judgment, you will go to Olam Haba. What did he say? He said, you'll be in my mechitza. You'll be in my place. You'll be with me. And you could have said, oh, you'll be in Olam Haba. I'm, a, I'm in the best seats. You'll be far further back. He says, you're going to be with me by accepting the judgment. So, so why is that? Right? I mean, why, why does he deserve that so fast he gets all the way up there? Something like this? So he says, he brings on this form, that when a person does a mitzvah with one of his body parts, he sanctifies that body part to the mitzvah that he does. So you give tzedakah with your hand, you sanctify your hand. We know there's 613 mitzvahs, each one relates to a different body part. But if, what, if I, what if a person does the mitzvah of Mesiris Nefesh for Kiddush Hashem? A person is willing to self-sacrifice his whole, entire being for Kiddush Hashem. Then they say, Kol Gufa Nasa Kodesh, then his whole body becomes holy because his whole body was engaged in this mitzvah and there for example when Pinchas killed Zimri by exhibiting Mesiris Nefesh right because because he could have gotten killed his entire body was sanctified and therefore he, he, he had the schuss to become a coin which has Kedusha Zagut very interesting what, what changed Pinchas into being a coin right I mean he wasn't a coin that means physiologically he was not a coin Hashem did not graze him with that. All of a sudden, he kills one person. He becomes a coin. Coin's not just a, a side little uh, uh, badge. badge. It's, it's the mouse. Your essence is a holy essence. It's a Kedusha Sakuf. It's a sanctity of, of body. So, so how did he get a sanctity of body? The answer is, he was most of his whole body. Since he wouldn't give up his whole body, that's why his body transformed into being a, a, a Kaddish Koyan that he was. So he's saying like this, Shaul, if he would have ran away from the battlefield, from the police, to save himself. So, first of all, that would have been a, a, even worse for the soldiers. Can you imagine if the, if the king doesn't show up to the battle? That would have been the, the, that would have been the biggest chil Hashem, the worst tragedy. They would have been in a much greater danger. The fact that he went to battle, even though he knew that he was going to die, so that was also mysterious nefesh for the benefit of the Jewish people. He gave his life up, to at least, you know, um, make the Jewish people look better, give them some courage. And for that mysterious nefesh, he deserved a tremendous, he elevated himself to tremendous kedusha, up to the point that he's able to be within the mechitz of Shmuel. Because really, what was Shmuel's great greatness, greater than other tzaddikim? As remember Chazal say, Shmuel didn't just sit in his uh, seat of judgment, he was most an effort to go from city to city to city to city. Those mysterious nefesh. There's a special mechitz, a special place in the world to come for people who are most an effort. And Shoal really, I guess, according to this interpretation, really didn't show any aspect of total mysterious nefesh. He did a lot of things. Not every tzaddik does is most an effort. You, you had the sun heaven before before Shmuel, we're not Moser Nefesh, and that's why a lot of bad things happen. So Shaul was a tzaddik, but where was the mysterious Nefesh? That's what Shmuel said to him, you'll be Moser Nefesh at the end of your life here. You know, I'm giving you, even, even at the end, and even though you're going to die, and all these things, but Hashem is giving you a way to be totally Moser Nefesh, that you can come back and be in my Mechitz as well. That's why he gets in that Mechitz. So you see how great the aspect of mysterious Nefesh is. Um... And one last thing, this Moshe Hanavim adds, he says another reason. Uh, he says, It's a tshuva that's measured against equally to balance out his sin. That uh, the Sfarim bring down, what was the difference between the sin of Shaul, for example, uh, of his sin of not destroying Amalek and the sin of David with Bathsheba? 
Right? So we already said this and the question is, why Shaul sins, he loses the Malucha? David sins, doesn't lose the Malucha. Why not? So we said the famous answer, Shaul's sin was regarding kingship. He wasn't acting as a proper king. David's sins weren't in being a king. It was other, it was in morality, this wasn't being a king. So therefore, uh, it's a sin in kingship, so you lose your kingship. But David sinned in another way. It had nothing to do with Malucha. Therefore, he remained with his Malucha. So now, when Shaul went out to battle, even though he knew his children were going to die, he could have saved himself. But why didn't he? Because he didn't want things to go bad for the nation. So there he did what a king was supposed to do with greater act of kingship. Where his sin was a big sin of kingship. So now his atonement has to be an atonement of kingship. Not be the king you're supposed to be. And the king's supposed to be what? The king, even though he can run away, like Gaddafi, right? The king has to say, I'm going to go to the troops to battle last day. And that was being the ultimate king he was supposed to be. And that becomes the ultimate tshuva. And therefore, he's able to go back to that machitza. Oh, very good. That was the ultimate kapara for the original. The original sin was, was killing out, uh, not killing out all of Amalek. That was it. That's why you lost it. That's why you have to die. But if you die the way a king's supposed to die, then you're going to be able to be treated in that way. Oh, very nice. Okay, Let, let's wrap it up. As they say, the last sukkum over here. Very, very, very sad ending. But Pasuk. Ches. So now he's dead. Uh, I'm sorry. Pasuk Zayin. Vayir Anshi Yisrael Asher Be'ever Ha'emek Vasher Be'ever Yardain And all the other Jews were on the other side of the Emek Valley of the valley and the other which would be the Emek Yisrael and other Jews on the other side of the Jordan River Valley. When they saw this and they were afraid and, and they saw it, rather, Kinasu Anshi Yisrael that the Jewish soldiers ran away the Chimesh Yisrael one of his Shalom's sons died what happened? And now they're and the police can, can do what they want. They left their cities by Yanusu and they ran away. People left their villages. And the police went in and settled in them. So this was more than just a military loss. This now becomes a geographical loss because uh, there's no more hope. There's no more king. Uh, the king. In other words, you lose a battle, the king can regroup, get the troops. You lose one day, you can come back the next day. When they saw it was such a, a, a complete defeat, and the king's even dead, and David, who knows where David is? David is in exile. So there, there is no leader. There's no leader. Their security has been compromised greatly. Therefore, they understood that they had to leave. Pasuk Ches, Vayhimi Macharas, was the next day. Now the police come to the battlefield. We have a police team with Fashed Sachalim. The police come to strip all the, the loot from all the dead people. And look, behold, the prize. They find Shaul, Veshlosh's bottom, and his three sons, Nofim Bar Giboa, they fell on Har Gilboa. So still they did what they could to humiliate him. They cut off his head. They stripped off his um, armor. They sent it around the land of the Plishtim all around, Levaser, to inform uh, and to inform it up till the base at Sabayim. The house of Atzabeim, which means their house of idol worship. As the Mitzudas explains, or somebody explains it, uh, Mitzudas Sin explains, base Atzabeim is the house of Avodah Zorah. Why is it called Atzavim? Because what does Atzav mean? Sadness. Because really, the idols make people sad. Why? Because you deify these beings, you think they're going to help you, you cry all day to them, and they don't answer you. That's what's called base Atzabeim. The, the house, so they, they paraded it around until they left it in their house of idol worship, thanking them for giving them this benefit. And to the entire people, they showed it to everybody. And as well, Pasuk Yud, and they put all his armor, base Ashtaros, in the house of Ashtaros, that's another house of idol worship. Ashtaros comes from the word Ashtaros Psalm, of sheep. Um, so it seems that they, that's some type of worshiping of sheep as well, and uh, and then you know the, the they're, they're publicizing this whole thing basically. Vesqviyaso and his body taku b'chomas beishon, and they stuck up his body in the wall of base shon, and uh, this, you know they with nails they they nailed him up to it as it were, as it were, uh, and then there's uh, the, the, the Mephoshim tried to um, um, make it fit into what it says in Divrei Yomim. Uh, where it seems to say a little bit, uh, a little bit different, but basically the general idea is that they 
put his body all over the place in different places to make a public display that he was killed and it was a great embarrassment. Or they put it in some place and then put it in other places. They'd want to put it next to their, uh, just like when they took the ark, they stole the ark, they put it by dog on their idol. So they wanted to put it by the different idols to show that they really were able to kill him. And, what Saul tried to avoid? No. But, he, but, but it's worse when you're alive and they torture you. You, can, you cannot avoid it totally. They're going to catch you. you, you Something he can do, but it's worse that when he's alive they torture him than when he's dead. They minimize that. So this is a terrible Chil Hashem. So what happened, Pasuk Yedalef, Vayishmu Elav Yoshve Yavesh Gilad. So the people of Yavesh Gilad heard about this. He says, Sher Asu Plishim Mushol, what the Plishim did to show. Pasuk Yedbeitz. Yeah. Vayakumu Kol Ish Chayom. So every warrior man got up. They went the entire night. They took the dead body of Shaul. When there was night, nobody was protecting it. And the bodies of his sons. From the wall of Beishon. They came back to Yavesh. And they buried them there. Uh, they burnt them there. So what do you mean, burnt them? So it's a lot of discussion over here. Some say they burnt them the way... They, you, it's an honorary thing to burn kings. Or, they say better, they, what do you call, they embalmed him with certain um, fluids that are very strong that, that heat up the body. That's the burning. In other words, it burn it to maintain it. It's also a very difficult shot to understand. So, the Radak brings one more shot. It means, and, and some say, yeah, Taki Gomorrah says they burned the kings. Uh, they buried them in, in their, uh, but others say burn mean burned all his artifacts burn his uh, armor, burn all the other things that belong to the king, because that nobody should really ever use that again. Others say that they burnt only the flesh, because by the time they got to him, worms already infested the flesh. They didn't want to burn him with worms, so they burnt the flesh off, but kept the bones, and they buried the bones. Very difficult shot, no matter how you slice it. The, the easiest shot to mount, when we could take is they burnt his, his armor. They burnt all the kingly stuff and not him, but a difficult shot nonetheless. And finally, Yud Gimel, Vayikhoes Asmoseim, they took their bones. You see, they still had bones. Even though they, even if it says they burnt, they had their bones. Vayikru Tachas HaEshel B'Yavesha, they buried him under the Eishel tree. It's a type of a tree. Vayatsu Mushivas Yomim, and they fasted seven days for him. So the only question um, that has to be answered, and where do I have it? I had it somewhere. Oh, it brings down the... Uh, the Pirkei Rebbe Lezer, why the people of Yavish? Why would the people of Yavish pray for nobody else? So the, the Pirkei Rebbe says like this. It says, also, they said like this. They said, also, what was the first kingly thing that Shaul did? But remember, go way back. After he was made king, people made fun of him. Some people made fun of him, right? So what happened? Remember, Amon threatened, a, a, he wanted to give a test to see what kind of king this guy is? Right in the beginning. Amon goes to who? To the people of Yavesh and said, we're going to make you our slaves and, and we're going to poke your eyes out and all these terrible things. And they sent word to Shaul, the novice king, and Shaul got the whole nation to come and destroy Amon. So they said, that man who saved us from the shame of Amon, ain't on chayom, leave lo chesed, aren't we obliged to show chesed? So Hashem said, you showed chesed with Shaul and his children, I will also show chesed for you. In the future, when Hashem will gather up all the Jewish people from the dead, the first ones who will revive from the dead is the half of tribe of Menashe, those who are in Yavesh Gilad. Li Gilad v'li Menashe. You will end up that you will be saved. So it, it's, a, it's a, you know, why, why does the Navi end it here? Because I guess he wants to end the Sefer at least on a semi-pleasant note. You're ending it. Usually you don't want to end on terrible, terrible notes. Show this and that. So you want to know at the end of the day? At the end of the day, you know, Shaul's good deeds did live beyond him. He still did, did good deeds. So don't take don't, hey, Shaul, he's dead, finished a wasted life, everything. It wasn't such a wasted life because, you know, what is the greatest chesed you could do? Chesed Shalemes is chesed you do to the dead. And this was a chesed Shalemes. The, the, the Navi ends with a chesed Shalemes. Ends with a chesed Shalemes. And why did he get the chesed Shalemes? Why did anybody care? Because you know what? He cared. The very first thing he did, he showed he cared. And he did care about his people. And it, and it did make an impression. Don't think Shaul's life was a total waste. He did end up being a tzaddik. And people were heroically wanting to save him from that. 
And that's really, you know, Sefer Shmuel starts with Chesed and ends with Chesed, just like the Torah starts with Chesed and ends with Chesed. The very first Chesed was with Shmuel's father, that he would do a Chesed. He'd want to get the people, remember, to, to, come, to come to Shiloh. You know, in, in spite of things were bad, he wanted to get people to come to Shiloh. He was kind to his wife. And finally, you see, there's a kindness that happens to him. Okay. Just like in the Chumash. Chumash starts with Chesed and ends with Chesed. So this started with Chesed and ends with Chesed. Okay, Shkreft, everybody. Thank you.